welcome to our webinar on biobank governance. We're very excited that you were able to join us today. My name is Liz Horn. I'm the director of Genetic Alliance Biobank, and we have two wonderful speakers with us today. Kelly Edwards, who's, the associate, who's an associate professor at the University of Washington, and Susan Trinidad, who's a research scientist also at the University of Washington. They both specialize in ethical, legal, and social issues surrounding biobanking, among other things. And they are going to help us talk about what good governance is and how we should be thinking about governance for our biobank. So I'm going – oh, but before I turn it over to Kelly, I want to remind you um, a few housekeeping things. Um, in our webinar series, all of our participants are muted but you will see a chat box that if you have questions, please type them in and they will go to me, the moderator, and you can send questions at any time during the webinar, and we're hoping to have about 15 minutes at the end to get all of your questions answered. But please continue to send questions throughout, and um, I'm going to turn it over to Kelly right now. Kelly? Great. Thanks, Liz. Um, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you, Genetic Alliance, for creating the opportunity to uh, to have this discussion today. I think it's a really important conversation to have. Uh, I'm just getting my slides into slideshow mode here. Is that looking good to you? Um, good. Uh, so, I know we have a range of people on the phone today, um, people from patient advocacy organizations, from rare disease groups, from hospitals, from academic centers, and so I know a, a number of you have been working with repositories already, um, and so a lot of what I'm going to say today may be uh, common knowledge to you, maybe things you've already worked through, and I just hope we can have a discussion at the end about how uh, strategies you've used to overcome some of these um, challenges that I think some of us are encountering along the way as we as we feel our way forward um, with ethical and effective biobank governance. One of the things that we are worried about with governance of biobanks is uh, reflected in this uh, Dilbert slide, which is, you know, this, there's a public, the public climate right now is is challenged by a kind of trust in our institutions, trust in our information, in privacy, uh, and so we, we this, this uh, cartoon kind of reflects some of our, our public perceptions of kind of what people might be up to behind the scenes. That is that we're interested in collecting their data so we can sell it, um, and it, it all becomes easier if we just dehumanize them by calling them data. And I know uh, for a number of you who work with patient advocacy organizations, this is something that would never cross your mind because your, your participants in your repositories are your clients um, and your constituents. And, uh, and on the other hand, I also know there are a number of repositories underway where we do, in fact, want to anonymize and aggregate and collect as much data as we can 
harms of a sense of violation of privacy or opening yourself up to discrimination um, if, you know, if health insurance companies or life insurance companies get a hold of the information, the potential of discrimination. But I, I want to call our attention to some of these less common concerns, uh, less common harms that we've seen revealed in a couple really public cases this year. And that's, um, you know, there might just be the harm of, of tying up resources or, or heading our efforts in one direction that's not not the most productive, um, mo the most productive research direction. There could be group stigmatization, meaning even if ident individual identifiers are stripped away from a data set, we're often still left with race and ethnicity or uh, geographic locations, and those you can come up with conclusions that could be potentially stigmatizing to a, a whole group of people. And those are usual uh, individual protections don't protect against those group harms. Um, there's also the, the latter issues of respect, lack of respect or lack of recognition where part of this move toward anonymizing these data sets is we don't get back to people. Uh, we don't reconnect with people and talk with them about what's going on with their sample or the research program. And that can be perceived as just, you know, as if from the participant's point of view, they don't matter in the system uh, and they're being treated with a lack of respect. And this is one of the harms we'd like to avoid. So I'm, I'm just going to review three of the, the cases that have been in the news this year. I'm sure these are all very familiar to you. But they're, they're important cases for me when thinking about governance because uh, I think they've done a lot to set the stage for our public climate right now and expect, and what I think is a real shift in how the public is expecting, what the public is expecting from research protocols and programs um, from what we used to expect. And so the first story is that of Henrietta Lacks and Rebecca Sloot's book is just a fantastic account of, uh, of this story, starting with the woman, uh, Henrietta Lacks, who in the 50s as a young woman had a very aggressive cervical cancer. And when she went in for treatment to the university hospital, um, some of her cells were scraped and taken. And as is common protocol, the, the residual tissue samples um, after her diagnosis was made were sent to the lab and used in research. And those cells happened to have incredible, uh, incredible capacity for reproducing. And so were used, uh, it turned into the HeLa cells that were used in a number of medical uh, innovations for the last 50 years and 60 years. They've really transformed uh, the state of medical development. Um, the way the story gets told and the way the story was experienced is, you know, from the family's point of view, they didn't, they didn't know any of this was happening. Uh, so the family's point of view, they found out 25 years later when genet a geneticist wanted to get in touch with the family and see what else um, the family might contribute to the nature of these cells. Um, this was the first the family had heard about any of this um, research program with the, the HeLa cells or the involvement of their mom in this program. And the next 25 years is a story of miscommunication, disconnect between the university, um, the research institutions, and the family who feel a personal connection to these cells. And so um, for me, this is really a cautionary tale about what we can do as a really a business as usual practice, you know, just using residual tissues from the hospital to advance research programs, and a family's experience of really feeling like it, it would have meant a lot to them, and it did eventually mean a lot to them to find out more about this program and what role their mom had in advancing uh, in advancing science. So the second story is the Texas newborn screening. Uh, blood clot story, which is uh, there where in all of our states we have these public health repositories of newborn newborn blood spots. Every state has a different uh, protocol with how they handle those blood spots. Some are discarded after the newborn screening is completed. Others hang on to those blood spots for a certain period of time, sometimes indefinitely. 
uh, and increasingly those blood spots are seen as a really valuable repository in themselves of a, popu a statewide population-based repository of data. And again, in keeping with our regulations, you can use the identified data um, without consent uh, to do research. And these data sets are used for epidemiology studies and, and so forth. In Texas, they started to use them to trade these spots with uh, the military and other research organizations to do test development um, and other research protocols. They traded them for supplies and other, um, they didn't quite sell them, but they were trading them for some valuable things. And parents ended up finding out about this um, through, a, through a reporter who broke the story. And it was one of these things where um, parents became surprised by the story. Uh, so, you know, what do you mean you've got this public health repository and now you're telling me you're stopped trading my baby's blood spots out there to the military for some unknown reason. And so some parents brought this to a lawsuit and sued the state of Texas. Um, and it got settled out of court. The state of Texas had just destroyed the whole 5 million um, set of samples um, and they're starting, starting from the beginning. And so just in brief, I think there's a number of lessons to be learned from this story as well. One is, um, you know, the sort of what the danger of surprising people can be. It can result in this loss of a massive public health resource. Um, the other lesson from this story is the power of just a few people to really take down a whole resource. So this really was the concerted effort of a handful of people um, to push this issue. And so to, for us here locally, we've really paid attention to we need to have all of our systems um, in place and above the board and very transparent and work on our communication so that we don't surprise anyone or, or leave that one person out who's going to be worried about something that we're doing. And the final story, just quickly, um, is the Havasupai case where, again, um, the the tribe had engaged with a diabetes researcher uh, with one set of expectations where the research was going and found out later, uh, by again, by surprise, that, that work had been done that they, they weren't, didn't agree to uh, in mental health and population origins, um, things like inbreeding in their, in their, uh, in their community. And so this, these stories at, taken as a whole, I believe really show us that we have to elevate our standards higher. In each, in each case, the researchers officially met the regula regulatory requirements. Uh, they were either, either using the identified data set, and which by human subjects regulations are not considered human subjects and therefore are not, not required to get consent for future uses. Um, in the Havasupai case, they had signed something like a broad consent that had indicated permission for future research in some open-ended areas. However, I think what we were saying is that these are really, these really run against, even with our regulations in place, they really run against what the public expectations were getting into those systems and those programs. So our, our job is to set the standards of excellence higher. Um, among the reasons for this is the, the way people perceive risk is a function of what might what we might calculate to be the actual hazard or the actual risk kind of multiplied by a level of outrage. And so anytime we have a surprise or a disconnect of expectations, you've, you've upped the emotion and our perception of a risk that this is a risky endeavor to be engaged in is, goes higher. So just to wrap up this cautionary tale part of my uh, remarks, you know, the, this idea that the regulations provide the floor and that the business as usual practices within science um, can sometimes create, can create harmful situations that we just didn't anticipate coming from the scientific community. Um, it's hard to anticipate what harm looks like. And so the way that we can get around this is by really engaging the public, engaging our participants, in conversations about what our intentions are with the repositories, um, being transparent about the kind of work we're going to be doing, and then asking permission um, 
of people before we go outside of any of uh, any of those the scope of the, the stated work. So our traditional systems for managing risk are are the IRB review, um, where they look at protocols before the research is started and they, they assess risk and and anticipate that risk and see if it's reasonable to ask people to even ask people to sign up for such a study. Um, we use a consent process where we're asking individuals to voluntarily assume risk. And however, I'm going to, I'm making the argument here that these are our traditional tools in research and have been in place uh, since the 70s. Uh, and they might be, we might be reaching our limits of the, the utility of these tools with this new science. Um, this new science is so dynamic and can be so game changing with technology and what we're able to do with genetic analysis, uh, with what we're able to do with access to data and information, that it's difficult to anticipate everything with these upfront reviews and these upfront permissions. And so consent implies that I'm able to really be clear about what's at stake and the decision that the person's making. And with some of these research repositories, we just don't know. And so um, what what part of what I'm arguing here is we we need to return back to some of the old fashioned research ethics coming out of the Belmont report of just reflecting back on respect for some of these cornerstone principles in research ethics and you know what what do we mean by respect for person and how can that be what what can we do to enact respect for persons we've been operationalizing that through consent forms but what else can we do um, to enact respect for persons? Beneficence is about um, assuring benefit, assuring that the benefit outweigh the risks in people with what people are signing up for in the research program. So how can we assure that our research programs and these research repositories are achieving benefits and, and benefits for whom, from who, for, from whose perspective? And points to the justice principle and how we can really assure that these benefits are being distributed equitably. So I'm going to highlight just two um, potential solutions and then Sue's going to give some more specific examples of how this has played out in one community. Um, but what we've learned about trust and trustworthy practices in institutions is it really takes attention to relationships and accountability. And the way that the relationships can play out, just as one example, is through this idea of recontact and reconsent. And from our, again, through our regulatory lens, we've talked about reconsenting people as kind of a regulatory obligation that people have a, an autonomous right to choose to sign up for something. From more of a relationship-based view, we've seen, we've reframed this idea of reconsent as an opportunity to really keep building 
been um, we've been having a number of these conversations around the world, really, about how to do this. I think this is an active, active live question for many of us. So I look forward to your comments and questions um, in the in discussion period. Thank you. Kelly, thank you so much for that great introduction. Um, I think it's given us a lot of things to think about, about how the choices we make in research might affect the research participants and how, in some instances, the current standards we have might have negative effects on people. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Sue next, who's going to tell us about some of her research. But I just want to make a quick reminder that um, everyone is muted, um, and if you have questions, please Type them in, and we will be answering them in the question and answer session. Sue? Um, so thank you for being here, everyone. And I, I will try and be relatively quick here so that we can get to questions, because I think there's certainly a lot to talk about. And Kelly's laid out a really nice framework for what some of the issues are that come up when we think about governance for biobanks. Um, and then also what can happen when things go wrong and what contributes to things going wrong. So what I want to talk with you about right now is a little bit of empirical data out of a study that we did here in Seattle. Um, the Electronic Medical Records and Genomics Network is a four-year project that's funded by the National Human Genome Research Institute. And the main scientific aims have to do with understanding how to compare phenotypic data across different data sets. So for example, if I'm doing a study on condition X and Liz is doing a different study on condition X, how can we combine those data and make sure that the clinical thresholds for what we're defining as an instance of that condition actually are comparable in a way that will let us work together in an effective, effective way scientifically? Um, in conjunction with that, we had an aim that was about ethical, legal, and social implications of this kind of research. And so that's the piece I'll be talking with you about today. Each of the five sites in this network, and they're listed here on the slide, had a community engagement or ethics aim. So um, you could, there's now beginning to be some publications out there. This is something that you're interested in following up on. The questions that we are all, we're all trying to address really had to do with what participants and potential participants in biobanking research think about why data sharing. Um, so the database of genotypes and phenotypes is a common database that has been established by NIH to facilitate data sharing among different research sites. Um, issues of returning research findings to individual participants. There's a fair bit of controversy about that. Um, as Kelly was mentioning, what the informed consent process needs to look like when we really aren't sure exactly what kinds of risks may come up for people who are participating. Um, what might constitute acceptable uses of existing data? And what people think about research access to the electronic medical records. Um, our overall aim is really to understand how those preferences might begin to inform governance policy and informed consent and other sorts of things that, that really speak to what Kelly was talking about, this relationship and accountability piece, and also how we communicate with the community at large and with people who have volunteered to participate in these kinds of studies. So we began with 10 focus groups. Uh, we were working with folks from an existing longitudinal cohort study on dementia that act the ACT study is the Adult Changes in Thought Study, and that's at Group Health. Group Health, I should say, um, is a member-governed health cooperative here in Seattle. They have about a half million members, and Group Health is unique in that it is both an insurance plan and a healthcare delivery system. Um, it was established about 50 years ago, and it really, um, the culture of Group Health is very much geared toward equity and fairness and member participation in governance activities of the health plan and the delivery system as a whole. So in terms of culture, um, they're not quite, you know, your average health plan. And they may be a little bit more um, in line with some of the relational elements that you all may have in common with your members if they're involved in a, in a disease community or in a rare disease organization. So these 10 focus groups 
um, we had some ideas that about uh, whether there may be differences by age, which is why, as you can see, we've divided folks up into these different age cohorts. And we spoke with about 85 people about these questions. Um, in general, they were pretty evenly matched by sex across those groups. Um, here in Seattle, we are a pretty white part of the country, um, so that's a little bit of a limitation for our study. And these folks were very well educated and pretty well off, um, which if you look at the research, that's kind of the cohort of people who tend to be most willing to participate in research. In general, most of the people we spoke with really did understand the point of data sharing, that sharing data would allow science to advance more quickly, which would help us get to potential health benefits more quickly. Um, many people spoke about the idea that sharing data was a great tool for efficiency um, and that doing it some other different way, duplicating efforts, would really be wasteful, and they were against that idea. Um, most people felt that if they were participating in a study, it was out of altruistic reasons. They wanted to benefit society in general, and they felt that researchers really had an obligation to leverage those contributions. So if they if they had given a blood sample or they had given data or other information, they really wanted researchers to do the most that they could with that information. We also asked about what people thought about who should have access to their information. And um, for some of you, this may be an issue um, because your biobanks will be an attractive resource to others. Um, most of the people in our sample considered that sharing within group health was just fine. And sharing with close collaborators, for example, those of us here at the University of Washington, was just fine. Nonprofits were fine. and. That was sort of the dividing line, because people felt that those groups that I've just talked about were all doing science that was directed at the public good. When we asked about for-profits, people began to have some different ideas about that. And, and one thing we may want to talk about in the Q&A piece is how this might be different in populations that are working toward a cure for a rare disease or working toward treatment, um, because there may be some differences in, in how we think about those issues in another context. We also heard strong concerns across every one of those sessions from people who worried about federal oversight, as Kelly was mentioning, the potential that there could be unauthorized, from the point of view of participants, non-health care or non-health research access to these kinds of resources. Uh, as you might expect, people were worried about privacy and confidentiality. That was the pervasive risk that people brought up. Um, but overall, most people said that they believed that the value of sharing, the scientific value of sharing, and the potential health benefits that could result from that science outweighed the risks to individuals. Um, we talked a little bit about promises of privacy, and people were pretty skeptical of the idea that we could, that anyone, in fact, could guarantee that their information would never get out, would never be accessed by someone who should not be able to get at it. Um, we heard many stories about, you know, the time that a guy left his laptop in his trunk and his car got stolen and everybody's social security number got out. So people were fairly skeptical about uh, guarantees of privacy. And we did hear from some people that they felt that if they were one in a million people, the risk to them personally would become smaller than if they were one in 50 people which was a, an interesting way of thinking about that. Um, overall, we did hear from people that they thought that the risk of having particularly their genetic information available for scientific use in this way was less risky than other places where they may put personal information out into the world uh, and kind of outside their direct control. So now I want to talk a little bit about reconsent. Um, we of the five sites in the eMERGE network, Group Health UW was the only one that was required by its IRB to seek reconsent from study participants. So what we were wanting to do was take data from the ACT study and put that into DBCAP, this national repository. And when we took that to the Institutional Review Board at Group Health, they said, well, you are covered for data sharing, but we think that DBGAP is a different kind of thing because it will be publicly accessible to qualified researchers. 
and it's new enough that we're not really sure what the risks are, so we want you to go back and talk to people about whether this is okay with them. Um, it mattered for the IRB that our po that study population was an ongoing study. The investigators had regular contact with the people who were enrolled in that study. So it was not the case, and as in some, as sometimes happens, um, if you're a 20-year-old study and you have lost track of everyone, for example, this may not be feasible. But in our case, the IRB determined that it would be uh, at least worth a shot <laughs> to go back and talk with people. Um, in general, where reconsent comes up is, as in our case, for the use of existing samples or data outside the scope of the original consent, it also has come up in the context of studies where participants are children at the time that they are enrolled and their parents give consent. And many people believe that at the time that they reach majority, 18 or 21, um, they should be recontacted and asked whether they still wish to participate, whether they still want to leave their samples and data kind of in that research repository for future use. Um, consent for adults who have experienced cognitive decline since they signed up is another issue. Um, in many cases, if there's a change in the scope of the study, an IRB may ask that you go back and get consent from a legally authorized representative or a surrogate decision maker. And as we sort of alluded to, it can be difficult. Even when you can do it, it can be difficult. It may, it may be difficult to track people down. In some states, like Washington, um, the IRB could decide to require consent from next of kin for deceased participants. Um, and it can be costly. In our case, it costs about $50 per person to go out and make this secondary con contact. Um, and usually that's not budgeted either in fiscal terms or in terms of time. One of the big worries for researchers, of course, is that if you ask people to agree, for something new and different, <laughs> they could always say no. In our case, the original consent was for dementia and diseases associated with aging. So we had done something right in writing a pretty broad consent form that would allow us to do many different things. The reconsent process was conducted mainly through mail, and 86% of those who were cognitively able to, to uh, give consent on their own behalf agreed to have their de-identified data sent to dbGaP. So from the research community's standpoint, this was great news that uh, people did, in fact, agree to additional uses of their information. Um, one question that, that we and many others had was whether if you have a very high reconsent rate, it means that you didn't have to go back, right? If everyone agrees that it's fine, did you really have to go back and ask them if it was okay? And so we did a little follow-on study to go after that exact question. We asked people what were important considerations in their decision making about whether to, to give free consent, and we, this was a telephone survey with approximately 350 people. And you can see here on the slide what the things were that mattered to people. Um, interestingly, concerns about benefit are rated much, 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 much higher than worries about risk. Some of the things that have been proposed as alternatives to reconsent are uh, an opt-out model, which would be sending a letter, for example, that says, we are about to do X, Y, Z with your information. Please send this letter back if that's not okay with you. Um, in our sample, 40% of people found that kind of an approach to be unacceptable. We also asked about a notification-only approach where we would send a letter that said, hello, thanks for being in our study. We have sent your information off to DBGAP. That was unacceptable to 67% of the people we spoke with. And when we asked if it would be okay if we had shared their information without asking them and without letting them know we had done it, 70% found that unacceptable. Now, what's important here to remember is that these are all people who did reconsent. So even among those who didn't have a problem with data sharing, who said, yes, that is okay with me, it was really important that they be asked. And another question, 90% said that they felt that it was important that group health had come back to them 
So I think these data really underscore the points that Kelly was making about the nature of the relationship, um, the need for ongoing communication, and conveying a sense of accountability and giving participants a way of, of understanding and knowing what's going on with ongoing research projects. Um, I think that is about all I have. I want to make sure that you all get a chance to talk, too. So um, I just want to thank my fellow investigators on that project, and I'll let Liz take it back. Thanks. Sue, we had a quick question about your presentation. Have the results um, from the eMERGE study been published? The results of these two investigations have been published. I'm happy to send you those documents to um, post to the resource site. Liz, Great. Um, the first one, the focus group paper is in genetics and medicine under my name. And the second paper, the reconsent paper, the first author on that is Yvette Ludman. And that was published in the Journal of Empirical Research on Human Research Ethics, also earlier this year. Great, and we can get the citations and all the information out yes. to the group later. Thank you. Um, we are having some wonderful questions coming in. I hope everyone continues to send their questions in. Um, I think that what I wanted to do next is I wanted to just talk a little bit about some practical applications of governance and some things to think about because I know many of the people on the call have their biobanks. We have advocacy groups who are um, in running biobanks, we've advocacy groups thinking about biobanks, and the governance issue is a huge responsibility. So how do we really start to think about this and what's important? And I found a great paper by Bartha Nosford's group that's part of the P3G Observatory, which is a wonderful resource online of many things relevant to science in general and collaboration, but there are a lot of resources for biobanks and questionnaire development for registries. And so this group from the University of Montreal wrote a paper called Building a Model Framework for the Governance of Biobanks. And the paper is available at the link below. And one other quick reminder, all of our handouts um, are available on the Genetic Alliance website, so you can um, download all of them. Next slide, please. In governance mechanisms, there are two things to think about. There are external mechanisms and internal mechanisms. And the external mechanisms are often things that we really don't have a lot of control over as individuals running a biobank. They include things like the social and cultural norms, um, laws, regulations, institutional requirements. Um, there's a lot of legislation and, and things that you're required to do. But it's important to know what exists and what you need to be compliant with you often don't have a lot of leeway in um, changing how you comply with these things. In contrast, next slide, we have internal governance mechanisms. And these are things that the biobank itself has a lot of control over. And there are different kinds of committees that can be important to set up, advisory committees, committees that do oversight on the science as well as the ethics, and then committees that run the day-to-day -day, um, operations of biobanks, like an executive committee, um, information about giving data out in the data access committee. And um, in this paper, they really describe all of these different groups, what these groups could do, and who might be appropriate to serve on these kinds of committees. So I think this is an excellent resource for people who are trying to set this up and need to develop internal governance mechanisms. Next slide, please. And the one thing that the paper stresses is that there's a life cycle of a biobank, and that there are different things that are needed as you're setting up and building your biobank um, in the planning phases, and then while you're actually collecting samples, and then when you're releasing samples. So this paper is divided into the before, during, and after phases. And it describes some of the things that should be considered during each phase. Before you begin, it would be good to engage the public, understand how they feel about this kind of a research collection. And again, it's depending, it depends who your audience is, who the public is. I mean, if this is an advocacy group building a biobank for their community, it's going out to their community. Um, 
And then it talks about the things you need in place while you're actually running your biobank and then the things um, once your biobank is built. Next slide, please. And the one thing that the paper stressed was that there, there's no great solution for every biobank. There are a lot of different solutions that can be appropriate. And they suggested some minimum government standards, and I'd like to just use this as a launching point for our discussion. Um, in the science, they suggest that research should be conducted that will advance science and benefit the population and individuals, and that the procedures and activities will receive regular independent scientific review. Next slide, please. And then there are ethical aspects to consider. The confidentiality will be protected, and this is something that's very important to participants. That the procedures and activities will receive regular independent ethics review. That the request for access to data and samples will be reviewed at some level, and there are multiple ways to do this, but it's important that requests are reviewed. And that the resource will comply with all relevant legislation, guidelines, and standards. Next slide. And that there will be expertise, um, that you'll have appropriate representatives um, on these committees. Next slide. And that there are communications aspects about how to keep the population, keeping them generally informed, and that participants will be able to register their comments and know that they will be addressed. And so that's all I have on this paper. I think it's a really good starting point. We have a resource. Um, tab on, on the Biobank website on tools and trainings. You can see our, our previous webinars. And Ken, could you put up um, the handout that we've created? And while Tam is um, doing that, I wanted to start, I thought I would start opening up the questions. Um, and Kelly and Sue, please jump in. I think this one could be for either of you. This is a question from one of our participants asking um, what a biobank is and how do you know if you are a biobank? Because they don't want to inadvertently become one um, by acquiring samples. That's, uh, I can start with that. I, I think it's a great question and it's one a number of our conferences uh, we, we start at that place of and I, I think there's a number of different kinds of answers. And some some people answer it. Um, you can see on the handout that's on the screen right now. It, it can be simply a, a a a bank, a registry. It can be a registry of data. It can be a regist a bank of samples or tissues or blood. And so whether it's an actual collection of just data or a collection of actual physical specimens. Um, yeah, I tend to use a broad definition because it's what we're, from an ethics perspective, we're interested in anything, any research collections, any collections of patient or participant data or material that would be used for research. Um, that any of these governance, you, whether it's a single investigator who owns that collection and manages that collection, or whether it's an institution or a state that manages that collection, the same questions that Liz had started to point to will have to be determined. As an individual investigator with a collection, you still have to decide what am I going to use these samples for, what am I going to use this data for, who am I going to share it with, um, what am I going to communicate back to my participants. All the same questions really, really pertain. It's just a matter of scaling up if the broad, the bigger and larger your, your bank gets. So that's how I would answer the question. I'd be curious if others had any other way to amend that. Great. You know, that Thank you, right, Kelly. That sounds right to me, Kelly. And um, the one other thing I would say is that I don't I, – I think it would be um, not a great thing if we had scared you off <laughs> establishing this kind of resource. Um, that's not the intent at all. Uh, and these are important resources for science and, and for reaching health benefits. Um, and so I think there's, there's just, we're just trying to surface some of the things to think through as you walk through that process. So Sue, this question is for you. What can you suggest when recontacting participants 
What can you suggest on recontacting participants is not possible due to loss of the link between the original participant identity and the specimen collected, while still having ethnicity and other demographic data? Um, if you have, so I guess um, it would depend on whether you had, what sometimes people will, people will do who are managing this kind of resource is destroy the link between the samples or the study data and contact information for people. And so that would mean that you wouldn't be able to return individual results or go back and get individual reconsents um, specific to, you know, a given sample. Um, at the same time, if you do still have even generic contact information, um, which has been disconnected from the data associated with that person, you could still, um, actually, you could still reconsent people. Um, actually, that's not true. Let me think that through. Um, because you could not reconsent them because you wouldn't be able to go back to the individual sample. But what you could do is go back out to that entire community in sort of an aggregate blanket approach and let people know this is what we're doing now. Um, one of the things to think about is that if you will be destroying the link between personally identifiable information, so the thing that says I'm Sue Trinidad and I'm sample 857, if you destroy that link, it's important to let people know that that is part of your process so that they understand that they won't be getting information back and they won't be able to withdraw that individual sample once the link is destroyed. So that's something that you would want to make sure and cover in the informed consent process. And I think this is a follow-up question that, that flows very nicely. Does the harm of not contacting participants once they submit their samples outweigh the cost of developing systems to contact and re-notify participants in an effort um, to in, improve how the participants feel about the biobank? And if so, does this raise another ethical issue about whether or not people want to be contacted again in the first place? Yes, and there are a couple ways you can approach that. One thing is, um, as I was just mentioning, to let people know ahead of time, if you're destroying the link um, that would identify them back to their study information or their samples, um, then letting people know up front that that's happening would be important. Um, I think the question about harassing people, because we did, even in our focus groups, we heard that, that people didn't want to be bothered every five minutes about things that they would consider to be minor changes. Um, so, so there is a need to sort of, I, I would say we need more research about what those categories are and where the lines are for people about what they think, okay, that's really okay with, with the majority of people, and then this other kind of use is something that we think is different enough that you would need to go back and ask. Um, there is also a question about, um, you know, organizations have limited resources. And so if you know that you have limited resources and you prefer not to need to go back to reconsent, then really making the consent process as broad as possible up front and making sure people understand that and have bought into that, understanding that, uh, would be an important step. And then the other thing I would say is that if there are some really inexpensive ways of making information in, a, in an aggregate way available to people who want it. Um, that could be on a website that people can go to and look at if they want to about what's happening with research. Um, it could be a newsletter if you already have existing communication channels out to your constituents. Um, but people really do want to know what's going on. The more of a stake that they feel they have in being a research participant and contributing to the scientific enterprise, the more they really want to understand what that means, what's being done with their stuff, and how are they helping. And I think that's a, a real opportunity for um, the research community to give back to people and build more of a partnership than we traditionally have. And I think that's really an opportunity for the research community to partner with patient advocacy groups because advocacy yeah. groups are already connected with their community and in many of our advocacy run studies um, through different biobanks um, and registries. The advocacy group is great at communicating in their newsletters, on their website, about what's happening with this resource. And I think the participants feel very connected to it. And they're also, that's usually a group that's very motivated about research and they want to learn more. And I, I think it's a, it's really a win-win to involve the advocacy group. 
So I wanted to um, let everyone know um, that we have uh, on the screen, you can see a checklist that we've developed. And we developed this checklist not to be all exhaustive, but we wanted to provide a starting place of things that you should think about, of, about good governance. And um, Kelly, do you want to talk about some of these points? Um, sure. I, I think we, I'm part of a research ethics consult service here at, in Seattle, and we've just been getting calls on a number, from a number of people who are starting either already have a repository collected or as the previous questioner indicated, you know, sort of find yourself with this collection and you hadn't really intended to head, to become a biobank manager. Um, but what people are finding themselves with is facing this whole series of questions and this the series of questions really that go beyond, I think many of us who do human subjects research are used to the, the human subjects division um, and IRB review of our protocols. But these are really more management kinds of management and communication and um, literally how are we going to function and, and maintain our relationships and maintain our systems of accountability. And so I think this process, I think um, just by by putting these in, in in one place can really help bring bring this to your management team or bring this to your advisory boards and and just talk through kind of how how have we how are we dealing with each of these these issues kind of from start to finish from how are we engaging people at the beginning um, what are we telling them uh, up when they they come on to this uh, repository um, what are we doing with the data who has access to it and so forth. Great. I think I'm going to go back to a few questions because we've gotten some follow-up questions based on our um, previous discussion. Um, one, one, this is about recontact, and the question is, do biobanks ever include in the consent an option for the subject to express consent to be recontacted in the future to update clinical information? Absolutely, yes. And I, I would recommend that very strongly as an approach for anyone who wants to um, maintain a registry function. Um, it could easily happen that if you establish a biobank, you know, and you're interested in a particular research question or you're working with a researcher who's given you um, a questionnaire, say, for example, to gather information about folks' medical histories, um, it could happen that in a few more years um, a new study comes up that you would like to be able to participate in or have, have the biobank contribute to but you don't have all of those questions answered. Um, if you have, in the first contact, asked whether it's okay to go back to people, then you're totally clear to go back and ask, you know, from a human subject sort of regulatory standpoint, you're totally clear to go back to people. And that would be an argument in favor of retaining those links between study data and contact information. Great. And just a, oh, go ahead, Kelly. Well, just, just to add to that, I, mean, I think what we're finding is there are both kind of ethical reasons and scientific reasons to maintain that link of identifiers. And I, I think previously our, our prior expectation is that if you maintain the link of identifiers, you're opening yourself up into a huge sort of regulatory oversight review um, process. But I think our IRBs are actually getting more savvy in this in this domain as they're recognizing you know, it's, it's just a matter, it just becomes another process. We just have to manage that data and manage that identity very carefully. But if we can, can maintain the link with participants, as Sue described, the, you know, the science can get better. We can ask more robust questions um, and, and we can maintain this communication and, and ethical contact as well. And just as a follow-up, um, at Genetic Alliance Biobank, that's how we do it. We're our member organizations. Um, maintain the link and then can recontact their participants to update clinical information as well as to gain additional samples. Um, we have a couple questions surrounding um, DD gap and um, how do you how do you address the use of archival samples that were collected before something like DD gap existed or everything that we know about DNA and science is now understood and as a follow-up as the um, biobank, 
will you ever really, can you ever really anticipate where all the samples will go when you're setting this up? So how, I think the question is really about future use and how do you anticipate that? I think I'll let Sue address some of the particulars about dbGaP because that was so central to the eMERGE project. But um, because there's a range of ways that, that IRBs and individual researchers have responded to that issue. Um, in general, this is one reason why our group, many of our groups are advocating for dynamic governance and dynamic processes because there are these game-changing things that we just cannot anticipate. So this idea of trying to do an upfront I'll just tell everybody everything I can possibly think of in the consent form, even making it as broad as possible, um, you know, that that's not really, that doesn't really become a fair, fair process because we can't anticipate something like a mandated data sharing uh, requirement, you know, submitting data to a federal repository, um, you know, that came in later. So that is something that people hadn't imagined, researchers hadn't imagined. So being able to have a dynamic process, which might look more like having a participant advisory board that's part of the governance structure who can help you make some of these decisions when they come up. Um, is this a, is this a case where we have to go reconsent people or re-notify people what we're doing, or isn't it? Um, that can be a really helpful way to have a dynamic governance process. Um, I guess that the only thing I would add that's a little bit more of a technical detail about dbGaP is that. The way that the submission of archival samples works right now is that if you have collected information or genomic data, um, and I should also say that dbGaP is, I'm sorry if that is my phone. Now. Okay, I will not move my head. <laughs> um, dbGaP is not a tissue repository, it's only data, so it's genetic data and phenotypic health information data. Um, but when a submitting organization sends data into dbGaP, the first thing is it's de-identified. So none of that contact information goes to dbGaP. The second thing is that the submitting organization, and in an academic setting, typically it's the IRB, has to certify that submission is consistent uh, or is within the scope of the original informed consent process. Um, they are also able to specify whether samples may only be used for specific things. So, for example, um, if you were doing a study on Alzheimer's disease, you could say at the time you submit that these data are only to be used for other studies that are also looking at Alzheimer's disease um, or possibly other dimensions, depending on, on what the original consent language was. So there is the potential to apply some restrictions about what was consented and how that data may be used by subsequent users. Great. Um, one quick question. Do you have um, any recommendations for templates for consent forms or resources that address some of these issues that we've been talking about? I know Laura Beskow just published a, uh, a template, a recommended template for consent for biobanks just this month, uh, if you search under Laura Beskow or we can post the um, post the reference, that we can we can get that information to you. I think part of what uh, Liz and Genetic Alliance can do is actually create this repository of templates and resources because I think we are all learning our way here. Yeah, there is also yes. some model language that came out of the eMERGE project, which I'd be happy to forward along also for that kind of a resource. Great. Well, I think we're coming to the end of our time now. I want to thank our our panelists so much for sharing their knowledge about this issue. And I really want to thank all of our participants for um, asking such great questions and really helping us continue the dialogue. I know that we didn't get to everyone's questions. Um, I will, we know, we know which ones we haven't answered, so I will um, try to get those answers to you um, later this week. And I wanted to thank everyone and for participating in our webinar, and this webinar will be archived within about a week or so on our website, and we hope to see you at a Genetic Alliance web webinar soon. Thank you, and have a great day.